Um, it's quite, quite difficult, I think, in 20 minutes to um, speak about why communism ended in Europe and mutated in Asia. It's such a huge subject. Um, but um, I'll try and then leave time for questions and discussion. I'm sorry some of you got to stand. Um, I'd like to start by mentioning one or two popular explanations for the end of communism in Europe, which I think are misleading uh, or even wrong. One is the election of the Polish Pope. Now this, of course, was a massive event in, in Poland um, when Gierak, the head of the Polish Communist Party, was told that um, a fellow Pole had been elected Pope. He said, Holy Mother of God. I mean, this was a terrible blow to him. And it was, of course, a, a huge impetus to um, solidarity, um, Polish workers um, defending their rights, um, trying to make Poland more democratic. They felt that God was on their side. And uh, solidarity in 1980, 1981 uh, was an enormous challenge to the Soviet Communist Party state. Nevertheless, in December 1981, martial law was imposed in Poland. And um, for the next um, six or seven years, Poland reverted to being a relatively orthodox communist state. Solidarity was only a shadow of its, of its former self, meeting in church halls and so on. And when it re-emerged in 1988, that was in response to events in Moscow. The whole of East Central Europe would have changed years before, even decades before, but for the fact that behind their unpopular communist rulers, unpopular in most of these countries, stood the might of the Soviet army and the threat of a Soviet intervention, as occurred in um, Hungary in 1956 and in Czechoslovakia in 1968. So really change in Eastern Europe depended ultimately upon change in Moscow. Another um, misleading explanation, I think, for the end of communism in Europe um, is the Reagan factor. That um, many people, not least in the United States, think that Ronald Reagan's heightened rhetoric against communism, the evil empire, as he called the Soviet Union in 1983, and SDI, the Star Wars um, uh, initiative, <coughs> uh, that this really brought about the end of communism. But in fact, Reagan um, overlapped with four Soviet leaders, uh, Brezhnev, Andropov, Chernyenko, and Gorbachev. And absolutely, absolutely nothing changed for the better under the first of those three. Indeed, the Cold War got colder, and 1983 was a very dangerous year. There were people in Moscow who thought that Reagan was psychologically um, <clears throat> preparing American citizens for war and for a preemptive strike in the Soviet Union. Now, of course, you know, if you believed there was going to be a preemptive strike, that was incredibly dangerous because you might want to get your preemptive strike in first. So this, this was dangerous. And, and Reagan was incredibly lucky that um, in March 1985, Gorbachev became Soviet General Secretary. Um, he wasn't chosen because he was a reformer. He kept many of his reformist ideas to himself. Um, he was chosen partly because um, all these um, leaders dying in quick succession, state funerals had become an embarrassment. You know, there was one every year. Um, so he was the youngest member of the Politburo, the most vigorous, and uh, he had already got himself into the position of second secretary, uh, and so he was the logical successor to Chernyenko. Um, now, many people think that the Soviet Union was in deep crisis in 1985, and I think that, again, is a misleading um, explanation. It's true that there had been a decline in the Soviet rate of economic growth from one decade to another. It was pretty sluggish in the first half of the 1980s, but the country wasn't in crisis. There weren't any mass demonstrations, um, massive strikes, nothing of that kind. So a combination of... Um, rewards for conformity and very severe sanctions for um, disobedience, uh, uh, for dissidence, uh, meant that the country was pretty quiet and passive in 1985 and expectations of massive change were not great at all. I mean, even people I knew in Russia who were serious reformers and serious critics of the regime, they thought that at best there would be some tinkering changes, minor improvements under Gorbachev. Now, Gorbachev himself became more radical in each year. Um, his uh, policy was not the same in 1989, 1990 as it was in 1985. So he began as a communist reformer. And within four years, he'd become a socialist of a West European social democratic type, I would argue. 
and that, that was pretty crucial. <laughs> so um, it's true that the long-term decline in the Soviet rate of economic growth and the fact that there's the technological lag between the Soviet economy and not only Western economies, but some of the newly industrializing countries of Asia, that was a stimulus uh, to change for people who were dissatisfied with the status quo. But the Soviet leadership and the establishment as a whole were not prepared to endanger their system. They were not ready for radical economic reform, marketizing reform, still less were they ready for radical political reform, any kind of political competition. Um, yet um, this economic um, decline of the Soviet Union, relative decline, uh, isn't a sufficient explanation of what happened because Gorbachev proceeded to give priority to political reform over economic reform. Uh, this was symbolized in 1987 when the January plenary session of the Central Committee was devoted to political reform and only the June 1987 um, meeting was devoted to economic reform. And economic reform was always a poor relation of political reform in the Soviet Union in the second half of the 1980s. And many economists hold that against Gorbachev, that he, he didn't pay sufficient attention to economic reform. And so some people, I'll speak about China in a few moments, some people would say the Chinese got it right, they put the emphasis on economic reform and people's standard of living and of course the rate of economic growth uh, improved immensely. But the other thing, that, apart from political reform, which Gorbachev emphasized, was ending the Cold War. And um, now in the Soviet Union, uh, people on the whole tended to support Soviet foreign policy, even under Brezhnev. I mean, they were told that um, the Soviet Union was always struggling for peace. There was a Soviet joke, I mean, a lot of Soviet jokes were in the form of questions to a mythical radio Armenia. And there was one uh, joke um, in which a questioner asked the Radio Armenia, uh, will there be a world war? Uh, long silence, and then the answer comes, no, there will be no war, but there will be such a struggle for peace that not a single stone will be left standing. Uh, now, a lot of people accepted, um, in spite of that cynicism which that joke suggests, accepted the Soviet um, view that they were always struggling for peace. But in fact, Gorbachev was the first one who made real concessions uh, to bring this about and seriously embarked on uh, a policy of ending the Cold War. Um, now these, the transformation of the Soviet political system and ending the Cold War, improving relations with Washington, these were the preconditions for everything that happened in Eastern Europe in uh, the late 1980s. Because as I've mentioned, um, Eastern Europe would have ceased to become communist, the countries would, would have become fully independent decades earlier, certainly years earlier, but for the fact that the Soviet Union was the hegemonic power imposing constraints on what could be done in Eastern Europe. Um, but there was a kind of circular flow of influence. The, uh, when people even in Hungary and Poland saw that the Soviet political system had reformed more than their own political systems, um, they naturally um, took this as a green light to challenge their own communist leaders and this happened very quickly then. Once they felt there was no longer a danger of a Soviet intervention, uh, then as we saw in 1989, those communist regimes fell very quickly indeed. Um, but. Um, there was a circular flow of influence because as these countries became fully independent and non-communist, then the most disaffected nationalities in the Soviet Union, not least Estonians, Latvians and Lithuanians, Western Ukrainians, thought, well, if Czechs and Poles and Hungarians and even East Germans can defend their national sovereignty and become independent, or later in the German case, part of a unified German state, then we can raise our expectations and instead of asking for more autonomy within the Soviet Union, uh, demand outright independence. And so that was what happened in 1990-91, the Soviet Union. But what came first was reform, then transformation of the Soviet system, and then subsequently the dissolution of the Soviet state. Gorbachev wanted reform, he wanted the transformation of the Soviet system, what he didn't want was the dissolution of the Soviet state. Of course he didn't want that, but events spun out of his control in 1990-91. Uh, now there are very many things happening in Soviet society which, um, uh, before Gorbachev, which led to this. Um, 
that I think one could say that you know communist systems sowed the seeds of their own destruction. Marx used to say that capitalism contained the seeds of its own destruction. Communism contained the seeds of its own destruction by nurturing um, universal literacy and a very strong higher educational system. There were a lot of people in research institutes in Moscow who were thinking unorthodox thoughts and speaking very freely among themselves in the 1970s, even the 1960s. Um, but it was only when a change of leadership occurred that they were given the opportunity not only to think the unthinkable, but to publish it. And all sorts of new freedoms were introduced in the second half of the 1980s in the Soviet Union, freedom of religion, glasnost, openness, which developed into freedom of publication. I mean, even books by Solzhenitsyn, even his most anti-Soviet books were being published from 1988-89. Uh, George Orwell's 1984, where you could be sent to jail for having a copy of that in pre-Perestroika, that was published in a huge Soviet edition. So all these things happened, a massive, massive change, and of course had their immediate effect on Eastern Europe. <coughs> so I think one thing that this shows is that a change of leader in a very hierarchical system can make a huge difference, potentially. Now, even the leader has to be careful because as long as you work within the norms of the system, you've got a lot of power. But if you challenge vested interests, you challenge the party bureaucracy, the state bureaucracy, the military and the KGB, then you could be overthrown. I mean, Khrushchev was overthrown in 1964 in the Soviet Union because he had um, uh, annoyed far too many of the important elites. And so Gorbachev had to maneuver very carefully. I mean, now we can read, I've read them, the Politburo minutes, and you see that he would sometimes come to the Politburo with documents which spoke about um, how the Soviet Union um, had become um, an administrative bureaucratic state and uh, they needed to develop um, a socialist pluralism. And these terms were first of all rejected by his colleagues saying pluralism, that's a bourgeois term, and you know you can't speak about um, this um, bureaucratic system that's been developed uh, and so you'd have to tone down the the rhetoric and tone down the document he said he would say well we'll go away and we'll make some changes but then a few months later he'd bring them back and gradually but there was actually a very fast evolution the agenda got became more and more radical and then at a certain point the public opinion was brought to bear, not so much a mass opinion, but um, the opinion of educated people, uh, the most educated people, and then through the mass media they began to put pressure on the leadership. Uh, and I think originally Gorbachev encouraged uh, this, well he certainly did, but latterly, in 90, by 1990-91, it was becoming um, out of his control for, for sure, um, and especially when it took the form of demands for national independence. Now the same point about the importance of leadership in a tremendously hierarchical system applies to China. And when we speak about mutation of communism in, China, in, in Asia, China is clearly the most important case. And um, under Mao, the most reasonable and at least unreasonable periods of Chinese communist history were when there was a more collective leadership um, in the first half of the 1950s, it was bad enough, but um, nevertheless, it was nothing like as bad as during the great leap forward of the Cultural Revolution. Mao's initiatives, which led to the deaths of millions and millions of people. Um, but the Cultural Revolution, which lasted from the mid-1960s to the mid-1970s, but was especially severe in the second half of the 1960s, that um, was really an anti-cultural revolution. Universities were closed down for a long time. Um, all the bureaucracies were attacked and uh, people were encouraged to attack everything old, except old Chairman Mao, of course, who was more sacrosanct than ever. Um, and um, the, the one good thing that came out of the cultural revolution was that there couldn't be the same bureaucratic resistance to marketizing reform under Mao's successors as there was in the Soviet Union. One reason why economic reform was slow to take off, even during Perestroika, was that there was a huge bureaucracy. Um, so many ministries um, concerned with different parts of the economy um, who, who were very difficult to overcome. Um, and uh, it was easier to change Soviet foreign policy, where you change the foreign minister, you change the head of the international department, 
and you changed your chief economic foreign policy advisor and then you could change Soviet foreign policy. To change the economic system was much harder. So China had that one advantage out of the Cultural Revolution, which in other respects was a disaster, a catastrophic disaster, that the bureaucracy had been weakened. And so one of the people who had been purged from the party leadership in the Cultural Revolution, Deng Xiaoping, who still had great support um, among, uh, w w within the party, he emerged as the de facto top leader of China. He wasn't even the de jure leader, he wasn't the chairman of the party, he was vice chairman, but by the end of the 1970s he was more influential than anyone else. And he introduced this dramatic change in the Chinese economic system. Now, to my mind, uh, a communist system has got six defining characteristics, and China today has only got two of them. So we can say that China is a hybrid in certain respects a communist system, in other respects it isn't. <coughs> These six characteristics, they can be divided in, into th two political, two economic, two ideological, insofar as those things can be differentiated. The two essential political characteristics of a communist system are what was called the leading role of the party, a euphemism for the monopoly of power of the party, that still exists in China, and what was called democratic centralism, meaning a strictly disciplined, very hierarchical party, and that still exists in China. The two economic defining features of a communist system were state ownership of the means of production, exception occasionally made for agriculture but not for industry, uh, and um, a command economy rather than a market economy, administered command economy rather than a market economy. The two ideological defining features of a communist system were the sense of belonging to an international communist movement and the aspiration to build communism, that classless, stateless society of the future, entirely mythical, but nevertheless that was the ideological justification for the leading role of the party. They were guiding people who were less enlightened to that goal of communism. Well, by 1980, end of 1989, 1990, there wasn't an international communist movement anymore. It disintegrated in the course of 1989. And nobody was speaking about building communism anymore, even in China. Um, and. Uh, in China, the economic features uh, also disappeared in the course of the um, 1980s. Today, two-thirds of industrial output in China comes from the private sector. So it's a mixed economy with a very strong private sector um, and essentially a market economy. Um, some people have called it an example of party-state capitalism. Uh, the two features of a communist system that still exist are the leading role of the party and monopoly of power of the party and democratic centralism. But even they work in very different ways from the, day, the way they worked in Mao's time. Um, I mean, for example, I've given a lecture in the Central Party School in Beijing on, on the end of communism in Europe. And they're incredibly interested in why communism ended in Europe. And there are very different books published with different explanations of why this happened in China. So um, it's a much broader scope for different interpretations within the democratic centralism than existed before. But in that sense, China remains a communist system, but it's a hybrid. Uh, and then, of course, other Asian countries have followed suit, notably Vietnam. The one huge exception, of course, is North Korea, which remains a totalitarian state. But elsewhere, Asian communism has changed. There are only five communist states left in the world, and four of them are in Asia. China, Vietnam, Laos, um, uh, North Korea, and uh, then in the Americas, Cuba. The other reason why communism has mutated rather than ended in Asia is because whereas in Europe, a sense of national identity and aspiration for national independence and anti-colonialism, those worked against communism in Europe and they've worked in favor of communist parties in Asia. So if you were a patriotic Pole, you tended to be an anti-communist. A patriotic Hungarian tended to be anti-communist. Um, but in China, in Vietnam, even in North Korea, they've all had, or Laos, they've all had very bad experience at the hands of Americans, or in the case of China in the 19th century of the British. <coughs> 
Um, and so anti-colonialism and striving for national independence, these were sentiments that communist, party could, communist parties could tap into. And so the Vietnam War, which was poorly understood by the Kennedy, it was poorly understood by the Johnson administration, this combined um, striving for national independence, combined anti-colonialism with um, the leadership of the Communist Party. And, and this was one reason why, I mean, there are some of the best books on Vietnam have been written by American serving officers there who wondered why the Viet Cong seemed so better motivated than the forces they were supporting of the regime. And it's partly because they tapped into the sense of um, Vietnamese striving for independence from the United States, from Western powers, better than the regime that the Americans were supporting. De Gaulle, um, in 1945, wanted to keep um, Vietnam under French rule, but eventually he realized that um, this was a lost cause and he was very critical of the Johnson administration and told them that you won't win. Um, you, uh, you can't really defeat this, this insurgency. It's got too much popular support. So um, these, I think, are major reasons why communism still survives in a way in Asia, uh, though it's mutated so much that, you know, in certain respects, it's not a communism that would be recognized by Marx or Engels. I'm not saying that Marx or Engels would have recognized Brezhnev's Soviet Union as communist either. That wasn't what they had in mind. Um, but it's gone a long way from Leninism uh, in the economy in Asia. Um, I, again, there's a <coughs> deviation of a different sort in North Korea where you've got the cult of the leader um, in a way which would, um, b would also have been anathema to Lenin. But it's got, all the, it's got most of the other orthodox features of a communist system. Well, I, I don't know how long I've spoken for, probably about 20 minutes. Um, and um, <clears throat> I've probably forgotten a lot of things I meant to mention, but I wanted to leave some time for questions and also for disagreements. I think it was. <coughs> I think it was. I think that um, from the outset, Gorbachev took seriously the danger of nuclear war. It could happen by accident. It could happen, um, you know, through a technological malfunction and you know, through um, the kind of tension that was being built up in 1983, leading to some foolish action. Um, so he took it seriously from the outset, but Chernobyl in 1986, that underlined his um, concern about nuclear weapons. If uh, an accident in one nuclear plant could cause such devastation, then uh, nuclear war it was brought home to him more than ever that this could destroy life on Earth. And indeed, both the United States and uh, the Soviet Union had enough nuclear weapons to destroy each other, to destroy life on Earth. You know, one reason why the um, explanation uh, that um, it was Reagan's show of strength on the part of the United States that produced the change in the Soviet Union. One reason why that is wrong is that in the late 1940s, in the 1950s, and in the 1960s, the United States was much stronger vis-a-vis -vis the Soviet Union than it was by the 1980s. It had a big military advantage in that time. From the early 1970s, the Soviet Union acquired a rough parity, in, uh, nuclear parity and the more general military parity with the United States. So even if in certain respects um, the United States was ahead technologically, the technological level of Soviet industry was pretty high. The economy as a whole lagged behind the West technologically, but all the best resources and a lot of the cleverest people were in military industry. So that could hardly be the explanation for the change. But Gorbachev, unlike anyone else in the Politburo that he inherited, took seriously the threat of nuclear war, and Chernobyl certainly was a further stimulus to that endeavor. Uh, yes, I, I, I was <coughs> in a group invited to China in 1988, and things were still getting better in the Soviet Union in 1988. It was becoming a freer country by the day, and there was political reform, but there was not yet the, um, <coughs> the kind of national um, independence movement that was threatening the integrity of the Soviet state. <coughs> and um, everywhere we went, um, uh, to, from one institute to another, because I was a specialist on 
the Soviet Union, especially Perestroika, they were asking me to speak in Perestroika, and a lot of them were very sympathetic to it. Now, of course, the most orthodox people in China regard it as a terrible warning. Um, and, you know, the one thing we mustn't do is go down the road of radical political reform. Uh, and indeed, you could argue that's another reason why um, you've got a mutation of communism in China, but the system has been preserved, is because they've avoided radical political reform. Radical political reform, by definition, means that all sorts of groups can defend their own interests, including minority nationalities, um, and uh, China has avoided that. At the same time, there are people in, in China, including in the Communist Party, which has got over 80 million members, who do want political reform. And you know, people speaking informally in China, um, in my more recent visit, um, <clears throat> were saying, yes, you know, we must have political reform, because they know that lack of accountability means um, many, many of these disasters, when schools fall down um, in a minor um, earthquake and yet the party building remains intact, that's because there's a whole lot of corruption and shoddy materials used in the building of schools and proper care taken in the party building. Um, and all sorts of terrible things happen, but you know, the party, state leadership can't be held accountable. Um, so there are people who seriously want political reform, but they all say, but it must be done gradually. We must have stability. And the other thing is we must remember that even now, um, peasants are still a majority of the Chinese population. Only just, I mean, when Mao died, about 80% of the Chinese population was peasant, but there's been a massive migration from the countryside into the cities. And so, you know, if you're a reformist-minded intellectual in China, if you wanted democracy tomorrow, that would mean you're placing your hands, your fate in the hands of the majority of the people who are peasants or first-generation workers. And do you really trust them, you know, to uphold these values which you espouse? So that, that's why I think, you know, even people who would, who would think that in Western Europe we've got a better political system than they have, don't want to try it in China tomorrow because you know, they wouldn't be the ones who'd be calling the shots, ultimately, if you had instant democracy. Um, but of course, Gorbachev would also have liked probably a more gradual um, <clears throat> uh, political democratization in Russia. But the thing is, once you allow a certain degree of freedom, uh, either you claw back that freedom or you let it continue, and then at a certain point it, it's out of your control. Um, so it's a very difficult thing to do, and in a, a country the size of China with its population, uh, immensely difficult. They've got one advantage over the Soviet Union that 80% of the population is Han Chinese, whereas in Russia only 50% of the population was ethnic Russian. So they've got less of a potential nationality problem than the Soviet Union had, though it's still there. Well, I mean, there's a huge... In, in Vietnam, the uh, nationalism went along with communism, you know, when the fight was with uh, the French or with the Americans. Um, now, in Russia, communism, you know, had a stronger hold on people's consciousness than it had in a country like Poland or Hungary. That, I think that goes without saying. I mean, there's a big debate among historians of the Stalin period about the extent to which people were pro-communist. Because we've got to remember that at that time, Russia was also an overwhelmingly peasant country and the collectivization of agriculture caused immense hardship. Forcible collectivization of agriculture in Russia um, at the end of the 1920s, early 1930s caused a tremendous hardship. So there must have been millions and millions of peasants who were felt very anti-communist at that time. Um, and so whether a majority or a minority felt pro-communist, anti-communist at that time is quite a difficult question to answer, especially because obviously there weren't any opinion polls, and if there had been, people would have been afraid to answer honestly, so they wouldn't have been worth the paper they were written on. Um, there were many people who were first-generation workers or first-generation professionals who felt the owed this to the Soviet system, and, uh, and so therefore did become pro-Soviet. I mean, look at somebody like Gorbachev. I mean, his family were peasants, his mother was barely literate. His father was a combine worker on a collective farm. He went to Moscow University, probably the best university in Russia, um, certainly the oldest, founded in 1755, did a, got a law degree. 
went into the party, rose through the party apparatus, became leader of the Soviet Union. So he wasn't going to feel anti-communist particularly. Um, the odd thing was that by 1988 he believed that the system was unreformable and had to be fundamentally transformed. But, you know, until then, throughout most of his career, he felt he got a lot to be thankful for to the system. Well, there are many people who didn't rise as high as that who, al who also felt that. But, you know, in a country without opinion polls, um, with such very diverse experience under communism, it's quite difficult to say where the majority stood at any one time. And, you know, a lot of people, Orwell wrote about doublethink. There were lots of people who had a kind of doublethink in the Soviet Union. Um, on the one hand, they were very critical of our system. Uh, on the other hand, they didn't like foreigners criticizing it and would defend it uh, you know, very strongly uh, against foreigners. And in particular, as I mentioned earlier, they tended to think that right was on the side of the Soviet Union in foreign policy. Um, and the, the Americans were more to blame for the Cold War than they were. Yeah. <clears throat> I think it's the, it's the different political system. I think that um, there's a qualitative difference between a communist party holding power in one region, one province of a country which is a pluralist democracy taken as a whole, than uh, a country where the communist party has a monopoly of power. Because by definition, in parts of India where the communist party ruled, you had um, information coming from other parts of India, from the national media, um, uh, and so the Communist Party couldn't have that informational control which they had to a large extent in, in communist countries. Even in communist states it wasn't complete because there was foreign radio which was jammed but still some of it got through. Um, but uh, I think that's a huge difference. Uh, similarly in Italy that um, you know, there, were, there, were there were cities which were governed by communists and, and with less corruption than, than some of the others. There were probably some of the best governed cities in Italy but they were within an overall pluralist democracy, one with many imperfections, but still. Uh, so I think, I think that's the crucial difference. Um, I think um, radical reform, yes, certainly had to either turn back or turn into something that was still more radical and became different in kind, democracy. I think you could have had um, a modest reform in the Soviet Union. I mean, after all, a country like Hungary had an economic reform with some concessions to the market and agriculture and so on. This probably could have been done in the Soviet Union. But once you had a, a political reform which gave people a voice and allowed freedom of publication, um, yes, then the system had to become different in kind unless you brought in the KGB and, and reimposed uh, the old system. Um, but, you know, a lot of people used to say it's unreformable, but by that they meant it couldn't change. Um, and, uh, you know, a lot of people like Jean Kirkpatrick, who was um, Reagan's representative of the United Nations, um, said that, you know, authoritarian regimes can be changed from within, but communist regimes are totalitarian, they can't be changed from within. And so this meant you couldn't have what actually happened in the Soviet Union, a reform that turned into liberalization and then a partial democratization. Um, and so then some of these people changed the, what they said later and they said, well, what we meant was you couldn't have a successful reform. Um, but that wasn't what they said originally. They said it was a, there was a qualitative difference between those countries and authoritarian regimes. And their problem was that they decided that all communist regimes were totalitarian by definition and by definition couldn't change. And so either the, the regime wasn't totalitarian or even a totalitarian regime could change. And in fact, by 1985, probably totalitarian wasn't the best description of the Soviet Union. It was highly authoritarian. But you know, within research institutes, there were some that were pro more reformist than others, others more conservative than others. That's not quite my image of totalitarianism. So anyway, it was reformed, then transformed, and then dissolved.